Good morning, everybody. Thank you for, um, for joining this morning's webinar. Um, yeah, I know everybody's very busy, so I don't want to keep you guys too long. Um, just to let you guys know, I will be doing the presentation. I'm Lee, and um, Catherine will be patrolling the comments and the questions. So please, if you guys do have questions along the way, you can pop, you can pop them in the questions section. Um, Catherine will be trying to answer those as we go. Um, but we do have a, a general uh, question section at the end. So I'm going to get the ball rolling so long. So welcome. Just a brief introduction of myself. I am Lee Williams, product manager at Gradesoft. Um, been with Gradesoft for what feels like an eternity now. Um, Caffeine and tennis are, are my vices and probably um, fast internet. I don't think I could probably survive in a world without um, fast internet. So luckily, we, uh, we have, I'm, I guess we're, we're blessed in this day and age now to, to not necessarily have to worry about slow internet unless it's on your phone and you're in the middle of the bush. So just to discuss uh, today's agenda, so just brief introduction, then I want to go through just an update on the COVID-19 uh, relief, especially now after the last provisional tax season. Then I want to give you guys just an update on the 2020 tax season, um, some changes that are coming in uh, in a short while. Then I'm going to look at some frequently asked questions that we've had. Um, we've just compiled a, a, a document on some of the most frequently asked questions. Then I'm going to take you guys through activating and just an overview of the new ITR 12 form. I know in a webinar previously this year, I did tease that it was, um, was available. Uh, it would have gone into pilot. It's been in pilot for, for a while now. Um, so yeah, we're, we're making good progress. And then, yeah, there's a, just a general question section at the end. Um, but before we get going, guys, I just want a, a little bit of housekeeping. So the webinar is being recorded and it will be shared with everybody afterwards. Um, all the questions will be answered live during the Q&A session. Uh, if Catherine can answer them along the way, then um, that'll help. I have enabled the ability for you guys to upvote questions. So if you see a question you would particularly like answered when that question is asked, you can upvote it in the question and answer section. I've got two polls planned for today and a survey at the end. So. I would really appreciate it if you guys would um, would answer the surveys they and, and the polls. They really are. Um, it allows me just to get a little bit of insight into into what people are thinking, what you guys are using, stuff like that. Please don't feel obliged to answer them, but um, ideally, it's a great way for us to get feedback uh, from from you know quite a large subset of people. Um, we're over a hundred uh, attendees right now. We're clocking nearly towards 150 at this point. So I think it's quite a nice thing for a, for this morning. So I don't want to take too much of your time, guys. So let's just jump right into it. So I want to start discussing the COVID-19 tax relief. So I'm not going to go over what the tax, what the COVID-19 relief was. I just want to focus particularly on an issue regarding provisional tax and the COVID-19 calculation. Um, so for those of you that utilize the COVID-19 calculation in Gradesoft, you may have been somewhat alarmed when you submitted the return to SARS and the statement of account after payment reflected a different balance than what was shown to everybody. So what we found was that there was a discrepancy between the SARS COVID-19 relief and the Great Soft relief. And what we did after some investigation, some, uh, some eagle-eyed viewers that are on the webinar today, and some interactions between SITE and SICA, was that SARS was disregarding foreign tax credits and PAYE payments in their COVID-19 calculation. So what I've done is I've just popped two uh, examples up for you to see. And you should, uh, you'll notice in the first one, um, we've got the taxpayer estimate. 
we've got the, the COVID-19 relief and a payment due. <laughs> um, what we found was that, yeah, SARS had uh, excluded the FTC and PAYE. So it took us quite a quite a few little um, a, a few little rigmaroles. Um, it, it did only unfortunately get resolved after the provisional tax submission. But what you guys can do is for any clients of yours that did have um, the COVID nineteen relief that you were looking to claim at, and you found the statement of account to be incorrect um, when they made the payment, you can go and redraw those statements of account. And SARS have now correctly handled the COVID-19 relief. They have gone and unilaterally uh, redone the calculation. So you guys will be able to, to now go and get that relief. Um, there should be no uh, underpayment penalties or anything like that. If you guys do have examples of that, you're welcome to, to send those along to us. We can uh, investigate those and see, you know, if we can poss possibly get you guys an answer on what's, on what's happened in your, in your scenario. So I'm going to start here with our, our first poll for the day. Um, and it pretty much just relates to your current great soft usage. So if you guys wouldn't mind uh, answering the poll that's just popped up on the screen right now, that would uh, be fantastic. Cool. I see. Um, I see the answers coming in. We are uh, at about eighty percent of people have voted so far. Thank you. I uh, yeah appreciate feedback. What it does look like is um, we've got uh, a high number of people that are currently using Gradesoft and the Gradesoft calculators. So good um, for the people that that don't. It's a shame. I uh, I'd love to know why. And uh, if we can, uh, I see there's a couple of you that uh, would like a little bit more info. So yeah, I will definitely get in touch. Um, we'll definitely get in touch after this. So I'm gonna leave the poll to run just for like five or 10 seconds, and then I'm gonna end this poll and we can move on uh, with the webinar. Cool guys, thank you for um, for the guys that voted. So just to give you a summary of the poll, we got 74% uh, of answers said yes, you currently do use the Great Soft Tax Calculators. 17% said no, and 9% uh, said no, but I'd like more information. Um, for the no and the no, I'd like more information. I'd really like to uh, yeah to have a discussion with you guys, see uh, see how we can get you guys using Great Soft. Cool. So if we move on, um, I'd like to move to the next item on the agenda, which is 2020 tax season changes. So as you guys will know, we are an independent software vendor uh, that allows us to pretty much create our own tax calculators. And we can then offer this to our clients. Um, what it also does is that we get SARS changes in advance. So there, we are not done for the year with uh, with the changes. We've got changes coming up for quite a few things, actually. So if I start, I'm going to start with uh, the first round of changes, which is IT14s or company tax changes. These will go live on the 4th of December. So there's three new questions that will deal with special economic zones, eight new questions that will deal with acquisition transactions, the solidarity fund donations, source code has been added in, a few adjustments to the tax computation regarding VCCs. There's also industrial policy projects linked to special economic zones, doubtful debt allowances. And then um, there is now a limit. Well, I'm completing a maximum of 20 VCC investments for a company. 
And then there's a, the addition of an exclusion rollover column in the foreign capital gain section. So all of this stuff is targeted uh, for go live on the 4th of December, uh, which we are currently working on now. I've got the team head down, um, running full speed at this thing. So yeah, we'll, um, so that's the company changes. The next thing we've got is we've got individual changes. These will also go live on the 4th of December. And this relates to not, not massive changes. We've already had our, our big changes for the year. I don't think uh, we need to rock the boat anymore. But uh, yeah, SARS interest found in the investment income section will now have a drop down menu that will allow users to select either income tax or VAT. So I think it's SARS just aligning um, the three returns. And then of course, the solidarity fund donation source code of 4055. So you'll see the solidarity fund is a common thread throughout all the changes that are coming out on the 4th of December. And we are, yeah, as I said, actively working on those now. And it wouldn't be a full Monty if we didn't have trust changes. So again, we've got the solidarity fund, 4055, and then just the section 11J that will be introduced to trusts. So the 4th of December, it seems, is going to be quite a busy day for SARS. Um, that is the targeted go live date. That is the day that we'll be releasing uh, our December updates. If there are any delays from SARS, we'll communicate that out to everybody and hold those back. To let you guys know, last year we had the same changes planned for the 4th of December, and these were postponed until February, uh, the company changes. So, yeah, let's hope that. Um, it is, a bit, it is a very difficult time for changes to come out, especially with people going on leave and stuff like that uh, in December. But yeah, that is the current targeted uh, date. We will be putting together documents on all the changes. If you guys um, would like to get your, your hands on those, you just please need to let myself and Catherine know. And we'll be happy to, to share that with you. Cool, guys. So I want to move on to one of the main topics for today, which is um, tips, tricks, and FAQs. So I'm gonna leave the tips and tricks out, um, the tips and tricks I really wanna get to on, on the new form, but I do wanna go through some frequently asked questions. So I just wanna grab that file. I see it's, uh, it's disappeared here quickly. Wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be a day if, uh, something didn't go wrong. So let me just uh, open up that document. And if you guys would like a copy of this document, I'll be happy to, to share it with you guys after the webinar. So um, what we've done is we've just gone through some of the support logs that we've been dealing with, and we thought it would be a good idea to share um, some of these questions with you. So if we look at uh, question number one, it's my client received a trust distribution. I've used source code 2598, but the system is still asking for a source code. What am I missing? So you'll notice there that our validation message, please provide a valid source code. So the answer to this is you cannot use source code 2598. You will need to use either source code 4212 or 4214, depending on uh, what is relevant to your clients. If we look at uh, question number two, I've got a query relating to retirement fund excess contributions. In 2018, the taxpayer had an excess contribution of 370K to be carried forward to the 20, 2019 year of assessment. This amount is not pulling through to the 2019 tax return. How can I remedy this? So our system does not automatically pull through balance brought forward contribution amounts from the assessments. The user needs to capture this in their own. So this is down to the tax preparer or um, you know, whoever's capturing the return in Gradesoft. The reason it's very difficult for us to distinguish whether a contribution amount was carried forward pre 2017 or post 2017. Pre 2017, the contributory amounts were treated separately, whereas after 2017, the values for all three pension funds, providence, and retirement were added together. Thus, the discrepancy arises. So, hopefully, going forward, when we get to further years, that discrepancy will become less and less. So, in the given instance, the excess contributions should be captured in the RA section over here. So disallowed retirement contribution brought forward and applied against current year lump sums. Okay, if I move on to the, our third question, 
My client immigrated overseas and ceased to be a resident during the current tax year. I'd like to know if the primary rebate, secondary rebates will be apportioned. What should I do to ensure the calculation is correct? So we find this popping up more and more. Um, a lot of a lot of people handling um, immigration. So in the calculation options, there is a tick box there. There's a couple of tick boxes in the calculation options that relate to section 20 underestimation penalty, the section 10 exemptions. But the one thing to take into consideration here is the highlighted one, which is apportion normal rebates in case of immigration. So the system will go and it will check the date, the amount of days. It will then go and apportion your rebates for the sake of your immigration calculation. Okay, Q4, my client's retirement lump sum benefit tax liability does not seem to appear correct. What am I missing? Which option should I tick? So you'll notice we're paraphrasing some real questions here. So um, I didn't want to, to pretty these up. I think these are real and true questions that have actually been asked to us. So over here, you'll notice that in the retirement lump sum and severance benefits, um, there is a tick box that says equate lump sum liability to directive PAYE total. So over the years, we've had a couple of scenarios where the retirement lump sums and severance benefits have never necessarily balanced back to SARS. And after a couple of investigations, we found that if we equate the lump sum liability to the directive PAYE total, we get to their calculation. So in a scenario here is you have the ability then to tick the box and this will align it with the SARS assessment. If you guys are still not getting this after ticking the box, there could be another edge case which we would need to investigate and have a look at. Our fifth question, my client received an exempt amount of section 1010. With the 2020 SARS changes introduced this year, it's been removed. Where can I complete the exempt amount? So we've had this question quite a lot and there was no real clear indication from SARS. We requested uh, information back from site and the response was that you will need to complete this exempt amount in the other non-taxable amount as per the below. So what you'll see is in the non-taxable amounts under other, you can add in the narration exempt amount for section 10 and insert your value there. Cool, I'm gonna move on to, to question six. My client has not submitted tax returns for the past three years. I'm currently looking at the 2019 tax return and the 89 quat interest does not seem to align with my manual calculation. What option do I need to tick to ensure the interest is calculated correctly? So this again relates to one of our calculation options in Greatsoft. So what you can do is under the section 89 quad interest calculation, you can tick the box to say calculate 89 quad interest and then put in your estimated assessment issue date. So the assess, the, you'll notice we use the word estimated assessment issue date. We would generally advise this on the, for this to be the day of submission of the return. You know, in a scenario of where an assessment is not automatically um, created, uh, that would be more of an edge case to this, which is why we do use the word estimated. But this generally we find allows you to get that 89 quat interest calculation correct. You'll notice here that you'll also have the option to do this on a return by return value. You can also capture a positive or a negative value. Okay, so if you untick the calculate interest automatically, we give you the ability to insert a custom amount yourself. That it does not necessarily have to be based on the calculation and that can be both a positive or a negative. Cool, question number seven. My client is not ordinarily resident in the Republic. For the past four years, they've been in and out of the Republic and I need to complete the number of days present in South Africa. For the past four years. Can GS roll over the days completed in the previous tax returns? that I do not need to complete the days in each return. Okay, you'll notice here that we've got some highlighted sections. In this instance, it's important to make sure that all the returns are completed in GS, in Greatsoft. If 
the information is completed in the residency section of the return, the days will roll over automatically into the current tax return and pre-populate the previous number of days completed. So that was something that we found for guys that deal a lot with, um, with expats or, or guys that are in and out of the country. So that's not really a new feature, but it's something that um, not a lot of people know exists. So we thought we would just uh, highlight that. Question eight. My client paid his own medical and paid two separate medical schemes for his two children who are currently in university. How do I complete the medical contributions in Gravesoft? Do I lump all medical scheme contributions together or must I complete three different sections in the return? So you will first need to tick yes to the question, did the taxpayer incur or pay any medical expenditure where they are the principal or main member? So once you tick yes to that question, you'll need to tick yes to the next question, which is, did the taxpayer pay any medical expenditure in respect of any immediate family member who is dependent on the taxpayer or family care and support? Okay, once this is done in the medical deduction section, you can ensure you complete the fund main member information. And then in the fund dependent section, include the number of medical schemes which the taxpayer paid the contributions. Follow the prompts and complete the section as required. So if we go down, we can have a look here to see fund dependence. We can then go and say, indicate the number of medical schemes, so two, and you can then go and select the medical scheme to complete the relevant section. Question number nine. I ran into a problem while completing the 2020 return for a client with interest from a lot of different accounts and banks. There seems to be a limit to the number of entries that can be added into it in, in addition to the pre-populated entries. A taxpayer or tax preparer is only allowed to show the top 10 investments in a specific tax year as per the new SARS rules. So this is something that um, I know a lot of people have queried is if the taxpayer has more than 10 accounts for investments, the user will need to add all the other accounts and place the aggregate value in the 10th row. So in a scenario of where you have 12 investment incomes, all 12 of those may come pre-populated from SARS, but what we do in Gradesoft per the rules is we will take the top 10 based on highest, uh, as we sort it descending on the value. So your highest number will be listed first, going down to your lowest number, up to number nine. So number nine will be, number one to nine will be your pre-populated rows from SARS. After that, the 10th row will be editable by a user, but it will be the sum of the 10th row and any other rows after that. And this applies to all schedules in the investment income section of the return. So you'll notice we highlighted all of them here and we follow that same logic across all of them. Now the last question, and this one is something that I know, never mind the top 10 or top 20 limits on some sections, is the pre-populated data that comes from SARS is incorrect. Either they have doubled the figure, they've lumped two figures together. We've had quite a few instances of this. So according to the ISV rules, we are not allowed, a user is not allowed to edit a SARS row. And up until this point, we've pretty much followed those rules, rules explicitly. To remedy that, you would need to go to the institution that provided SARS that information. So it could be a bank and they would need to submit a correction to e-file. Once they've done that correction, you have the ability then to refresh the return on SARS and you can then refresh that down into Gradesoft. And we will purge the incorrect row and we will bring in the, the new SARS rows. So what we found is that even in a scenario there, banks and institutions can sometimes not immediately respond to questions. So what we found is that we needed to give users the ability to 
somehow fix the data within Gradesoft without having to go through the institutions. So this is not something that's currently available on the on the old form. So the next thing on my lineup, you'll notice I added three little stars here. And I said the new ITR 12 form does allow a capturer to be able to delete pre-populated data. So what we'll allow you to do is if you find a row that is incorrect from SARS, you have the ability to delete that row entirely and recapture it yourself. Just a, a note on this is that we're not encouraging, you know, ideally the idea is for people to always try and correct the information. If you don't have the ability to request or to correct the information, you can go into Gradesoft and delete that particular row. then we have to, um, then we allow you to delete it. So in the new return, which I'll take you guys through now, we're now at the end of the FAQ. Um, I will show you guys how you can remedy this. So there are two options to doing this, um, both of which we've pretty much proven to work. Um, so what I'll do is I'm just gonna jump out of here, jump back to our slides. And before I move on to the new form, the last poll for today. So again, if you guys wouldn't mind, uh, I'm going to launch a poll now. And if you guys wouldn't mind answering, wouldn't mind answering it, that would be great. Well, guys, we're sitting at 77% um, of people have answered. Thank you. Uh, 79. I'm going to leave the poll to run for another 15 seconds. Um, and then I'm going to close it out and we can move, uh, we can move on. Cool, guys. I'm going to end that poll. Thank you very much for the 129 of you that, that voted. Um, to share the results with you, um, do you use the Gradesoft Trust Calculator module? We had 41% of people answer yes. We had 47% of people saying no. And 12% of people saying no, I'd like more info. So, yeah, for, for those of you who didn't know, Gradesoft, um, we have calculators for both ITR 12, 14s and trusts. Our trust calculator, I believe, was released uh, officially in August of 2018. Um, it is an additional module in Gradesoft, but it does allow you to do full trust calculations and submissions to SARS e-filing via Gradesoft. Cool, guys. So I want to move on to, to the, the highlight for me today, and it is to officially announce the release of the new ITR 12 form in Gradesoft. Um, we're, it has been in pilot since July. Um, we, I'm gonna just thank all of our pilot sites for, for the wonderful feedback so far. I know a couple of guys on the call are already using it. We have been uh, extending our, our pilot process and we're at the point now where our release coming out in a couple of days from now. So our November release, which will be early November. Um, I'm very confident that everyone will be able to go and switch on the new form um, and in, enjoy the, the fruits of our labor. So to give you guys an indication, uh, about three years ago, we identified that um, the ITR 12 form for guys that were working remotely was just not performing as we wanted it to. We also found the technology, you know, we started writing these forms uh, five, six years ago. So what we've done is we have 
now started with the ITR 12 and we will move on to, to other forms as we go along. But what we've done is we have completely rewritten the form in new technology uh, focused around usability, focused around performance. And our goal for, for V1, which is where we're at now, was a like-for-like -like replacement to be able to give you guys the same calculation, the same feel, and to maybe add some bells and whistles. And we're going to take on this and we're going to build on it. So to activate the new form in Greatsoft, um, you will need to activate a system option. So our system options are located in the top right-hand corner under system options. If you don't have access to system options, you are welcome to contact either your Greatsoft administrator, they will have access to the system options, or you can contact Greatsoft support and we'll be able to assist you with activating this. Just note that when you do activate the form, it will be activated for everyone that does ITR 12 returns. To activate it, um, when you open up system options, you can expand e-tax, you can expand tax calculator all. And if you scroll down, there's a new option here that says enable access to new ITR 12 form. Okay, so you'll see mine's flagged as yes. Um, and what this will do is once you flag this as yes and you come into the uh, ITR forms, if I go and search for my client, this, the no accessing the form doesn't change, but when you click on the form, you'll notice that instead of popping out into a pop-up, we open into a new window and the fun now begins. Okay, so this is the, the new ITR 12 form. So this is based on uh, yeah, brand spanking new technology. It is completely scalable. So it will work on mobile, on small screens, um, we've also added some, some nifty features to it. So if we just start at the left-hand side menu bar, you can search for a particular section. So if I start typing in CAL, it will filter the menu bar to a particular section. Um, we've also got a thing here that says, only show me the incomplete sections of the tax return. So you can hot filter like that. For guys that want to filter alphabetically, you can filter alphabetically. You can also auto hide the menu bar. So that will go and it'll replace it with a little menu bar over here. Or you can just click the hide option and it will then just pop up and pop back in. Okay, something to notice is that if we go to the preferences page, each time you tab through the form, you'll notice the little green guy will pop up here that says save automatically. This is saving your sections on the fly. Uh, you'll notice there's very little sign of processing or waiting. Our key thing here was to provide a great user experience, but also allow you the ability to, 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 to capture faster. Something we've also enabled is there's a button here called autofill. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, unanswer some of these questions. So you'll see these four questions here I've now unanswered. And you'll notice that on the left hand side, we've got a little red bubble showing four. So what that is, is each section, we validate each field. We know which are the mandatory fields that you should be capturing. And we alert you to sections that are incomplete. So one of the key things with the autofill was that once a return has been retrieved from SARS and it is in the processing state, you would have got your pre-populated information and you can go and you can answer only the questions that you want as yes. So again, I'm just going to come here and I'm going to just untick all of these no's. And what the autofill will do is when you click autofill, you'll notice it'll automatically populate any, on, any, any unanswered questions as no automatically. Okay, so this is limited. It is actually available on the old form, but the button is not as prevalent as on the new form. So if we move along, um, you've got the same questions. If we look at the top control menu bar, so the first button here, if you hover over any of them, we've gone for a new icon pack, a new look. Um, your first button here is your validate button. Um, you've got your save button and then your thumbs up and thumbs down. So I, I, I took a, a little play from, um, from the guys over at uh, Facebook and social media here. 
to be able to show you guys. So if you'd like to progress this return through the workflow, you can use the thumbs up. If you'd like to send it back, you can use the thumbs down. What we've also got is we've got a universal search. So let's say, for instance, you wanted to search for the word. No, uh, let's go. So I can go and search for the word investment. And it will go and it will show me all the sections where investment is an answer. So what I can do now is from that shortcut screen, I can actually say, you know what, I want to go and click on this and the return will automatically take me to that section of the return. Okay, it'll remember my last search and I can continue to jump around the return if I need to. Uh, if I clear this out, okay, we've also got a scroll to the top. So if you want to just shoot to the top of the return, you can. We've got our reports menu. So there is your standard reports. And we've also introduced a quick calculation button. So what we can do is we can click on the calculation and no matter where you are in the return, the system will go and it'll perform the tax calculation. And when it runs the tax calculation, you'll see that the tax calculator will throw out any notes that there are. Okay. Um, We've got a close button and then we've got our, our menu. So here you can see uh, your retrieve return, request return, marker submitted external, and being able to refresh the RP5 information or refresh any investment income. We've kept that, uh, that stock standard. Uh, you can also page through different sections of the return by, um, by using the left and right. So what you'll notice there is we also highlight which section you're on in the in the menu. So something to keep in mind is if you fire the validate button, um, it will go and it will run full return validation. But what we've added is we've added an errors and notes section. So here, if you run the validate, it will go and it will say, hey, there's something in taxpayer information. Please confirm that the banking details are correct. So what that means is that that, uh, that question has not been answered. So if I click on that, it will take me to the section in question we'll notice that, there we go, it is highlighted as being shown that it has not been answered. And if we look at the menu bar, there's a one here. So the minute I answer that question, the return will now tell me, okay, you are now happy to go. And we can see there, so the next time I run validation, okay, We've also got just assets and liabilities and other deductions, but then we've also got investment income validation. Okay, so this is now where I wanted to show you guys some of the stuff that we've been working on in the new technology. So in the old form, uh, if we go to something like investment income, uh, your detailed schedules were a little, a little icon, and when you clicked on them, the detailed schedule would pop up on the screen. Uh, in the new form, to be able to scale to different mobile devices, um, our detailed schedules now slide down. Okay. So here up at the top, you'll see the total, and here you'll see the detail. And what we've done is we've also added in a, a little legend, if I can refer to it as at the bottom. So here you'll see e-filing read only rows. So these rows I cannot go and I can make changes to because these are rows that were pre-populated from SARS. You can go and you can add a row and you'll see that we, Im we immediately add in a, a row here. So I can say, and I can press enter and you'll see that the total at the bottom is now reflecting 321. And the minute I close that, it updates the grand total. Okay. If I uh, hover down on this, we can now see the two different types of rows. And there is a third color to this. The third color will be the 10th row, a 10th row that has been pre-populated from SARS um, that it will, it will show you a blue, and that will show you that it is a pre-populated row from SARS, but you do have the ability to edit it. Okay. One of the questions that we had was, and I can, thankfully, I can see Kathy answering questions, guys, in, as, they're, as they're coming up, um, is 
that once a return was submitted on the old form, you did not have the ability to access the detailed schedules. That is now available in the new form. So even once a return is submitted to SARS, you will still be able to come into the return and view the detailed schedules. Uh, we do also have a download function. So you can now download, you can still download them. They now download as HTML instead of, um, instead of Excel. There is a, a guide on how to get this into Excel if you'd like it to, but we've done it as HTML, which will allow you to just quickly access it once you've downloaded it without the need for Word or, or Excel. Okay, um, another key thing, and this was something that I registered in the frequently asked questions, was pre-populated data from SARS. So we have always allowed users on IRP5s. You cannot edit an IRP5 that's pre-populated from SARS, but you do have the ability to delete an IRP5 that has been downloaded incorrectly or the information is incorrect. We've now introduced the same logic on the, the pre-populated line items from SARS. So if we take local interest, you'll see here the e-filing rows that are indicated by this little legend over here, but we've now enabled the delete button. So I can now go and I can delete that particular row and it will now allow me, I've now only got three rows of pre-populated data. So you can now go and add a new row as a user captured row. SARS, has, SARS will not know whether it's a user captured row. This is just purely for Gradesoft to be able to show you internally on the return um, what rows you can edit and what rows are, are, user, are user added rows. So I can now go in thousand and I can add that back. And you'll notice that the, the total updates the minute that you have closed that row. Okay. So if I go to my return history, we've made a couple of changes here, and this is purely just for scalability. And this means that your, here is your return timeline. So here you can see when any e-filing functions, when any processing happened, you can see that who made changes in the ITO 12 preferences section. And we keep a, a history of pretty much all of this information in Gradesoft, just to give you that peace of mind on, on what's happened with your return. Uh, if you are using our relational workflow, you can click on the My Approvers section and you can see who, who's marked as a preparer, who can uh, final review, who can mark the return as notify client, or who can even do e-filing. You can look at what my actions are, so you can see what rights you've got. So you are a reviewer for one person, a second line reviewer, third reviewer, and then the primary capture. So here you can see the primary capture on the return. So I can now say, please make me the primary capture. So the return will assume my rights. Okay. Something that I realized I hadn't mentioned to you guys was we've also introduced the ability for you to add negative amounts in. Okay. So one of the questions was also that you needed to do a balancing out act. Um, again, not necessarily advised. We did have a client who tested this. They did add a negative amount in and it did go and uh, that return did go for manual, for manual audit. But you can go and add in a, a row. So up correctly. And you'll notice that your amount updates. We do have some, some validation in place there to say that you cannot uh, submit a return that has a negative total. Okay, so your totals here must always be positive. Uh, we've also got validation to, to tell you that uh, if you are changing the amount, we know the amount that was pre-populated from SARS, we will give you, we will throw you a note to say that um, you are now changing the investment income amount to below what SARS had had. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run validation and it will then go. And once I've run validation, there's no errors on my return. I can now go and I can progress it through the workflow. So I now have the ability to say, cool, I'm going to progress the workflow. I can now select who my relevant person is. So I'm just going to assign it to myself and I'm going to say mark now. 
and we'll go and we'll revalidate the return and we'll progress it through the workflow. Okay, it's going and it's performing validation to check that this return will submit. Um, there is a system setting in Greatsoft that asks the return to check um, whether it has, whether it will meet SARS validation or not. So we have specific validation and SARS also has specific submission validation. There is a system setting to enable that SARS validation throughout the entire process. So instead of getting to the point of submitting the return, you can um, fail the validation even before here. So you'll notice now the returns locked because it is ready for review. So I can now go and I can advance this. You'll see it's now review one started. And because I have approval rights, I can take this return through the workflow process. So I can choose now to mark it as review one complete, or I'm gonna progress it to final review complete. I'm gonna send it back to myself again, just because I want it for the purposes of this. So it's now gonna go, it's gonna save any changes that I've made and it's gonna progress me through my workflow. What you will notice is you will notice that we've now got a couple of different guys. So um, the next status after final review in the relational workflow is client notified. So you'll notice that the client notified button, this is purely just a status button. Um, this can be activated. And we've also got a security token for what we refer to as overseer. So at this point in time, what you'll notice is the return is locked. So once it has gone to final review complete, all the sections in the return cannot be edited. They can be viewed, but they cannot be edited. Um, we have enabled from a security perspective, something called the overseer, right? And if you enable the overseer, this will allow you now to go and make changes in the return. Okay, so this is a security control token. Not everyone will see it. I just wanted to demonstrate to you guys the power of that overseer function. It is security controlled. So if you've got a tax administrator who may need to make changes, instead of sending it back through the workflow, we can activate that overseer mode. Um, while I'm here, I, I did see a question that popped up about, can you uh, go directly to finalize the return? So this, the workflow that you see in this return is based on what your system is set up to do. We've got three possible options, which is review by relationship, which is the one I've got active here, which is that you can build a spider web. So you can say, uh, I'm Lee Williams, but Catherine can only review my returns, or you can pick the person who you want to do at that point in time. Um, you can then go, or you can select someone. So if someone's off ill, you can go and select a different person in the workflow chain. That is if you've got relational workflow active. If you are not using relational workflow, you've got the ability to just, once you are happy with the return, you could click the straight finalize button. So I'm just gonna send this return back to myself. And after client notified, why don't you like me today? There we go. And I can now hit the finalize button. So this will now mark it as finalized and I can send it to whoever the person is that would submit the return. And now only once the return is finalized will my submit return option become available. Okay, so if you're not using relational workflow, you'll be able to just straight submit or straight finalize the return uh, without going through any of the, the workflows. Okay. So that is, in a nutshell, the, the new form. Um, again, as I said, it can be activated right now in your current version of Gradsoft. Uh, there are some, some adjustments coming out in our November updates. So once that update is loaded, you'll see some even more, uh, yeah, some newer things. And what we've also done is we still have all the latest changes in the old form. So if you find a scenario where you would like to cross check something, you're not sure, you know, it's people sometimes don't necessarily like change, but if you would like to access the old form, if you click on filters, when you're in the ITR form section, there is a new tick box here that says use new view form. You can um, untick that and you can now click on the return and it will go and it will open up the old return for you. So you can go and you can cross check something or if there's a particular function that um, 
you know, may not work on the new form as you expect it to, you've got the ability to, to go and actually access the old form. What the system will do though, is each time you access the RTR forms, it will always default to using the, the new return. Okay, so yeah guys, so that really much covers the, the new form, the activation of it. Again, just to remind you, it is activated in system options. If you don't have access to that, um, speak to your Gradesoft system administrator or um, get hold of the Gradesoft support team and they will activate it for you. And yeah, I really hope, um, I really hope that you guys will, will enjoy it. Uh, yes, so Cindy, I'm going to answer your question. I see it pop up right now. Um, you can use the new form. So yes, you can you can use it right now if you activate it in system options, it's active. Um, now, Marie, uh, can a user open the old form for specific taxpayer while the users? Yes. So the each user, the setting here of using the new form is user specific, right? So when you activate it, it will activate it for all users. But if a particular user wants to use the old form, they can untick this. It will not affect any other users. It will only affect them. So they have the ability at this point in time to say, I actually want to only, I want to open this client on the old form where everyone else can continue using the new form. Okay, I'm on. That one's been answered. Cool. So I'm going to just jump back to, to here. And we now are pretty much at the point of where we've got questions. I do see Thank you to Catherine, who has been uh, tirelessly answering questions while, while we've been going. So we're really only really sitting with three open questions right now. If you guys have got um, if you guys have got more, um, we can do that. Um, so Sebastian, once the return is submitted to SARS, we need to print preview in order to see details of interest earned. Is there an easier way to do this? So Sebastian, you will now be able to access on a submitted return. So if I go and um, and look for a return that is marked as submitted. So here we go, this uh, beta Naomi is marked as submitted. Um, oh, I opened the, the old form, whoopsie. Um, if I go and I just activate the new form and I open beta Naomi, in the new form, the detailed schedules are available, right? So I can go to investment income and I can now pop this down and I can go and I can download this. So even though the return is locked and it is submitted, we have enabled you. We have enabled you to to be able to, to view that. Okay, so that, uh, that yeah, um, Marlene, I've noticed something here. So Natasha, uh, sorry, let me just um, how is interest paid shown on the on the tax return? Um, Oh, sorry, I, I see the questions jumping around. So your interest paid would show up um, on the old form and the new form as they previously did. Natasha, I think we can take that one uh, on that one offline so I can just understand fully what your what your requirements are there. Um, Anesu, will corporate return with with corporate returns is the new form available to? Unfortunately not. So the new form only relates to RTR 12s. Um, as I said, we rewrote it from the ground up. So it has taken us about three years to get here. We've learned a lot of lessons along the way. Um, but we are going to look at uh, rewriting. The, our, our, our next thing now, once we finish with the current RTO 12 project, will be to start looking at rewriting uh, the corporate return. And then after that, we'll look at trusts. Okay, that, that question has been answered, Marlene. Since the update this weekend, our reports, um, Marlene, you need to please just uh, contact our support guys. Uh, uh, that's not necessarily something, there was no great sort of update run on the weekend. There were uh, infrastructure updates run. So you're, you, if you contact the support guys, they'll be able to, to sort that one for you. Uh, now, Marie, is the security in terms of editing notes that are not your own better than the old form? Yes, so in the new form on ITR 12s, I know that this is something you've logged and something we are looking at is you can um, not edit notes that are not your own. So if I go into the uh, the notes section, oh, I picked a client. Um, 
Oh, I picked a client that doesn't have notes, but you cannot edit notes that, that don't belong to you. So let's just check org 001. I know I was working on, on one of these when I double checked it. Yeah, so here we go. So here you can see posted by supervisor. So I cannot edit or delete these because I'm logged in as myself, Lee Williams, and I can only edit or delete those. Okay. Um, Makia, so to enable the new form, I'm just going to run through that again. You'll go to system options. Uh, if you don't have system options, you need to just contact your administrator or contact rates of support. And you can go to e-tax, tax calculator all. And there's an option here that says um, enable access to the new RTR 12 form. And you can flag that as yes. Okay, guys. Um, that pretty much um, concludes today's webinar. So one I'm going to, um, uh, Ayanda, I think um, Ayanda, the, the new form does not relate to, to RTO 14s, but um, yeah, please just send that to our support guys on, the, on that uploading of docs and they'll be able to, to assist you. Yeah, I wanted to just say thank you to everyone who joined today. Um, we, uh, I really hope that you'll find benefit in the new form. If you guys, uh, I would really appreciate when you leave the webinar to answer the survey. Uh, it will just guide me on what our users are looking for out of the system moving forward. Um, and yeah, if you guys want to join our user groups or, you know, just want to discuss the best way to use Gradesoft, please reach out to me or, uh, or, or Catherine or to both of us. And um, yeah, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.